Welcome to your favorite Sunday morning show, Media Monitor, with me, Alicia Jali. Now, today, we're going to do things a little differently. This hour, we'll take you through some of the highlights of the NC's local government election manifesto launch that, of course, took place yesterday in Port Elizabeth. We joined the masses of South Africans in paying our tribute to struggle stalwart and former PAC President Clarence Mlam Limakwetu. And we'll also take a look at this week's biggest newsmakers and the continuing woes at the Gupta-owned Oak Bay. And then we'll wrap up our show by looking at what happened since the Nigerian girls were kidnapped by Boko Haram. As tradition, though, here are some of the top news making headlines at this hour. A very good morning to you. Search and recovery operations are expected to continue today at a disused mine which collapsed at Pongola in northern Guzulu Natal. Rescuers managed to save one of the men who was found trapped before the rescue attempt was later called off yesterday. Former well, South African Dandoenko Sigunene has returned to Tandukukanya Township in Pumalanga to a hero's welcome. It was the first time the newly crowned Miss South Africa has returned home after being crowned. She is determined to make a difference during her reign. In your sports news, Kasta Semenya and Wade Fanika produced standout performances in their respective disciplines. Semenya also became the very first South African athlete uh, to win the 400, 800 as well as 1,500 meter titles at the same SA Championships in Stellenbosch. And now for a quick look at today's newspaper headlines. That's the Sunday Times there and the headline is of an alleged plot to oust President Zuma after the local government elections. The City Press runs with a story about ANC leaders warning that local government elections could be costly for the party because of past mistakes. The Sunday Independence front page story is about the ruling party cracking the whip on local councillors ahead of the elections. That's the weekend August and it's leading with a story about gangs targeting tourists and another on Casta Semenya running the fastest time in the South African Championships yesterday. Last but not least is the Sunday Tribune which has a story about a mysterious death of a three-year-old after she fell off a hospital bed. Well, uh, all Sunday newspapers are running with the NC's manifesto, making it the main story of the day. It is time for a quick breather, then I'll return with the NC's manifesto highlights. Please stay right there. For refusing to give the Civil Rights Commission his financial statements or his bank account printout. We've tried to negotiate with him for quite a long time. 
from November, we've been trying all sorts of mediation and to give him space and time to go to the bank and get the printout. He has refused to do this. And it means Section 41 of the Serial Rights Act must then kick in. So we are today laying formal charges against the prophet for that reason. Welcome back. Now, as promised, let's now have a look at what happened at yesterday's proceedings in PE. The biggest story this weekend must be the launch of the NC's 2016 local government election manifesto launch in the highly contested Nelson Mandela Bay Metropolitan. This is how the party president Jacob Zuma's message of welcome went. We welcome you all to the launch of the 2016 local government elections manifesto of our glorious movement, the ANC, Umbuto Wabantu Bonke, Siane Mugela, Nonke, Glumtimbi, Wogwetula, Usomkulu, Kakongolose. Woketo, lo hulmeni basemaka, lo somkulu ubalula ukuthi yini esizo yenza eminyageni emshano ezayo uma sikubega nomsebenz wakwenza ngono is in pillows abantu. In line with the constitution, our country holds regular elections. We held the last local government elections in 2011 and are preparing for the next elections on the third of August 2016. The ANC is guided by the Constitution of the Republic in all the work it does to improve the quality of life of the people. The Constitution of the Republic calls for the improvement of the quality of life of all citizens and the building of a united and democratic South Africa. It also outlines the socio-economic rights that citizens are entitled to, such as the right to water, social security, housing, education, health, and others. We have made it our duty as the ANC since 1994 to work with the people to ensure the enjoyment of these rights through, through the delivery of quality services. 2016 local government elections will be held on the 3rd of August. Now we look at the role of the local government and what ANC's manifesto encompasses as President Zuma explains here in this clip. Local government is an important sphere through which these services are delivered because it is closest to the people. We have come a long way in transforming and improving local government since the dawn of freedom. 
before 1994, there were over a thousand local authorities for white people, Africans in urban areas, African communities in homelands, as well as Indian and colored communities. The arrangement was designed to systematically divide the South African people along racial lines. The ANC government has fundamentally changed this by establishing a democratic system of local government that seeks to unite people and build better communities. The ANC theme for 2016 is advancing people's power, local government is in your hands. In line with this theme, we are moving a step further in making people the center of governance. We have heard your concerns about the manner in which councillors were chosen in the past. It is for this reason that we have involved communities in the process of nominating candidates for the forthcoming 2016 municipal elections. This has helped in choosing the best candidates to be ANC public representatives. We have also heard the call for councillors to be more visible and accessible. We have thus ensured that our councillors hold the report back and feedback meetings with their communities and will continue to improve on this. In case where some ANC councillors did not perform well, we encourage communities to hold them accountable. Our reporters that were covering the manifesto launch also spoke to people on the ground in order to find out what type of issues they expected the ruling party to address. Let's have a look at what they said. We are expecting that the comrade president must express exactly what is happening in South Africa. As you can see that there's a flame that is burning in South Africa and the opposition parties are attacking the ANC. And we are expecting that the president must clear that air. And you are expecting also in the manifesto to create the job creation, the build of schools, the build of clinics, social development and health, so that is the opposition parties must not attack the ANC about the petty things that are happening in South Africa. And we are believe that it's the only ANC that can help us to achieve all these goals since it came to power and we have been celebrating in four years now, so we don't see any other hope that he can come from other parties except the African National Congress under the leadership of Comrade President Jacob Zoom. We expect the ANC to actually continue with its program as per the previous manifesto as we are going towards the 2016 local government elections. So we expect the ANC to indeed speak to the programs that will indeed ensure that the ANC deliver in terms of its aims and objectives, which of uplifting the poor and ensure the creation of uh, job creation, especially for the youth, as we know that the huge number of the citizens is the youth that is unemployed. So we expect the ANC to speak into those issues. What thing from our government is that there must be an FET college where young people are equipped. We want a better future for all of us, education.
the area of the erosion of the image and credibility of parliament, <coughs> in particular the National Assembly, is one that is of concern to us. And as far as we are concerned also, there was an understanding and acceptance that it's something, of course, that has been facing us as the fifth parliament. We agreed on the way forward, which is to make sure that the, we, the implementation of uh, the court judgment takes place. That is what we are going to make sure that it happens. Welcome back. You're still watching Media Monitor with myself, Alicia Jali. We are taking you through the ANC's manifesto launch highlights. Welcome back. Now, South Africa is one of the countries that has a challenge of the highest unemployment rates in the world. As many would have expected, job creation came on top of the ANC's manifesto. Let's listen in to how the president addressed this on this clip. Our people, especially the youth, are sitting at home doing nothing because the economy is not growing fast enough to create much needed jobs. Our country, our continent and the world are experiencing slow economic growth. The ANC has a concrete plan in place to respond to the slow growth and create jobs. Our municipalities, guided by the National Development Plan, will place job creation and sustainable livelihoods at the center of their local economic programs. At the national level, a nine-point plan is being implemented by the ANC government to boost economic growth and job creation in various sectors such as the oceans, economy, agriculture, mining, the energy sector, information and technology, water and sanitation, and tourism, among others. Well, the issue of poor service delivery also came under the spotlight during the ANC's door-to-door -door campaigns in the Eastern Cape. Building up to yesterday's manifesto launch, lack of service delivery has led to several violent protests in certain parts of the country. The Eastern Cape community members made use of the door-to-door -door opportunity to raise their grievances with their leaders. Here were some of their concerns. In this area, some roads are being uh, uh, constructed but they are pointing out at other areas where there's lots of uh, need uh, to deal with the potholes, to deal with the gravel roads, the water, electricity that they've raised as well. These are the issues of service delivery which we believe are very relevant to raise now because the, the uh, local government elections is basically about those services. We evaluate where there have been weaknesses, where we've made mistakes, and we accept that in certain areas there have been weaknesses, Particularly in relation to delivery, we have moved slower in a number of areas. That is what we want of ANC councillors, that they must be close to the people, they must be connected to the people, they must know the issues that the people are concerned with. If you weren't uh, listening in yesterday, apparently now uh, the ANC is going to introduce something where councillors are going to sign something of a, you know, something of an affirmation to try and track their performance as well as uh, be held accountable. Well, we're going to continue with our ANC manifesto highlights after this short break, looking at the internal challenges within the party as well as its formations, reactions of the manifesto launch. Please don't go anywhere.
I want to unreservedly apologize on behalf of the department and also on behalf of those that we are working with, uh, other government departments that we are working on to initiate the online registration. There are some parents that, unfortunately, due to limited resources, if you don't have or cannot get a space in one school, you need to get into another public transport to go to another school. If you are not assisted there, you need to go to another school. If you are not assisted, you need to go to another school. Media Monitor welcomes you back. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Don't forget to interact with us on our social media platforms and tell us what you thought about the ruling party's manifesto launch in PE yesterday at SA Media Monitor. Now the ANC launched its manifesto amid rumors of an internal or internal disagreements within the party, partly caused by the recent scandals and criticism involving the president after the Concord's ruling of Angandla, as well as its tripartite alliance partners. Several NEC members also raised the issue of unity within the party. Did you miss it? Well, we have it. Here it is. Confident SMKMVA that the people of South Africa will vote the ANC back to power. It is very easy for us to convince young people to continue to vote for our movement. Sanko is here to say to you, comrade. That let us unite as one with our hands on our plows, our eyes fixed on the work, and our hearts with our people. Let us join hands together as one and face the task of working together for the resounding victory of the ANC. Let our goal be bring all our grandfathers, our youth, our mothers, our sisters to go and vote and vote. We're calling for the outsourcing uh, to be reversed and employees be employed on a permanent basis in those areas because uh, they've been there, they've been doing the job, so why don't employ them uh, on a permanent basis? There is a lot of corruption in our institutions, including local government. So we need to intensify the campaign against corruption. The second thing that we see as a threat to us as the SACP is factionalism. All right, of course, you've been watching uh, some of the reactions there by, of course, the allies of the NC on what uh, they would have wanted the president to address. But still on election-related news, political parties this week signed an elections a charter of ethics, committing themselves that they will observe democratic processes as they campaign for this year's local government elections. They may hold opposing and often confrontational political views, but for one day, South Africa's political players have come together under one roof to sign the Charter of Election Ethics, which will govern their campaigning ahead of the local government elections. Political party leaders say signing up for the Electoral Charter of Ethics was only the first step. They have also vowed to carry the message embodied within the Charter to their rank and file. It's an important step in maturing our democracy that we've signed this pledge. Every so often, parties have to go back to the electorate to get a mandate, and some parties win and some parties lose, but it's the spirit in which we hold these elections and participate in the elections that's critical. It is such events that ensures that our people remain focused upon what is best for South Africa, and that is that we shouldn't take elections, free and fair elections, for granted. Each and every one of us as citizens and as political parties have a role to play. We welcome the opportunity to be amongst the community of political parties in the signing ceremony of the Charter. As the Professor Zulu has said, there is a culture of impunity amongst political parties in their conduct of elections campaign. Primarily because there are absolutely no consequences for such conduct. I express our support for the Charter of election ethics and commit the IFP to uphold the principles therein. Since our first democratic elections, the IFP has raised concerns over the very challenges this charter actually addresses. 
We make primary call on our own leaders and members of the Congress of the People, not just to admire the pictures on the television. They must study the contents of these documents. The Charter also demands political parties promote respect for the rule of law. Dumala Mutlaudi, SABC News, Johannesburg. All right, well, that's how we wrap up uh, the ANC's manifesto launch. Highlights after the break. We pay tribute to late struggle icon and former president of the PHC, Clarence and Lamli Makwetu, who was laid to rest in yesterday in Kofimba. Do stay with us. land issue is probably the foundational issue up, upon which everything rests. The land issue is what people are saying, this is how I can ground myself in this country. This is how I can ground my citizenship in this country. This is how I can find my roots again, if my land can be given back. And that is an area where we are um, investigating claims that they put forward to us, claims that went uh, to quite advanced stages. And then you see how the legalese and the lawyers and the different interests come in and block people's access. And we would like to see how we can assist in unblocking that. These are, some of them in our view, are really low-hanging fruits that can be addressed very quickly. Others are long-term. And we would like at least to put those processes in place so that we can come back in our report and in our reporting to the communities to indicate to them what is it that we are proposing, what is it we're going to submit to Parliament and what are the obligations that we are putting on government departments and on communities themselves to start to give effect to this because we have no other choice. We must turn this around. Welcome back. Don't forget to share your views on our topics today at SA Media Monitor. Now, another big story this weekend was the funeral of struggle stalwart and former PAC president Dr. Clarence Makwetu in his hometown of Tofimvaba in the Eastern Cape yesterday. He has been hailed for his selfless contribution to our country's democracy. And our reporter, Nati Bingos, attended the funeral and filed this report for us. Bidding farewell to an esteemed struggle stalwart, Florence Mlamli Makwetu, attended by leaders of all PAC splinter groups, including the African People's Convention and the Pan Africanist Movement, paying their last respects to the leader who once united them all. Tributes and messages of support poured in. The Makwetu family, humbled by the outpouring of emotions, a big turnout and a rare show of unity in the fractured pan-Africanist fold. Given a resounding send-off by just about everyone in attendance, the mortal remains of Clarence Makwetu departed Kwaju Farm one last time in the company of close family members, including his widow, Mandisa Makwetu, returning back to Oita village, his place of birth, where he will also be laid to rest alongside other family members. On Atipingos, ABC News, Oita, Ektofimba. 
Rest in peace uh, to the late struggle stalwart. Now, people from all walks of life had something to say about the late uh, PAC president. Let's take a look at this clip. Was the president of the PAC. Uh, that's a great leader. He fought for our freedom. And people who fought for freedom, there's one thing about them, it's common across the board, is that they fought for freedom for the love of freedom not because they want to be free themselves, for others to be free. So we must accord him the necessary respect for having fought for our freedom. He contributed, and the other claim from, from us is that all the old stalwarts of the PEC have a background in the NC Youth League. In this province, we pride ourselves of having produced many outstanding leaders. He's one of them who has made a significant contribution in the struggle for freedom. We are so grateful uh, that the president acceded to our request that uh, he be accorded a deserving uh, send-off. Well, as apparent to us, uh, that um, uh, always appreciated people who took the initiative to work with their own hands. Uh, he never liked this idea that all of us will be taken through education and decide that the next thing we're going to do is to submit a CV to somebody else for a job. It was everything to us, in so much that if there is any problem, even today, the people are still thinking that they must go to Makwetu and tell him about the problem that is uh, taking place within the, uh, the members of the party. And he used to solve those problems. So many people are talking so nicely about him. It shows that consistence, patience, and uh, moreover, tact. All right, now let's move on and focus our attention to another story where there seems to be no end in sight for the Gupta family businesses. Their woes follow weeks of allegations of unduly influence in cabinet appointments and securing tenders with the government. The claims have led to four banks and an auditing firm parting ways with the family's businesses. Let's take a look at this insert package by Labour reporter Bongen Mutu. The Guptas, much talked about, yet very little is known about them. Today's announcement that they've decided to relinquish their executive roles in their multi-billion rent business came as a shock to many. But analysts say they are not surprised as Oak Bay faces an existential threat following the closure of its bank accounts by APSA and FNB. Auditing firm KPMG has also turned its back on the company, citing what it calls association risk. The suggestion made in their press statement that thousands of jobs are on the line suggests that the company does indeed face an existential threat as a result of not having an auditor and possibly also not having an official banker. And the only way in which the company probably perceives it to have an opportunity to regain uh, the credibility and the chance of continuing as a going entity and uh, a going concern is to get an auditor and to get a bank, uh, a banker, and that in turn requires the Gupta family to recuse themselves from the boards and from the manage, direct management of all the uh, Oak Bay companies. Oak Bay is a private business owned by the Guptas. It is listed on the JSE. Jamin says relinquishing their directorships does little to dismiss the barrage of criticism and allegations of state capture leveled against them. I don't think this so solves the stigma created by state capture. There have been too many statements made by ministers or former ministers uh, implicating the Guptas in this uh, program of state capture. There is also a whole lot of stories about specific companies getting involved and being threatened with uh, not abiding by the, uh, if they didn't go ahead with the kind of state capture we're talking about, for the stigma to disappear as a result only of this move. Jamin also believes the decision by the president's son to jump the Gupta ship 
also does not resolve the issue of alleged state capture. Certainly it might assist in cutting a little bit of the uh, perceived ties between the Zuma family and the Guptas, but it does not take us back to square one and absolve President Zuma of the stigma associated with the perception of state capture of and what some might call presidential capture uh, created by the relationship between uh, him and the Guptas in the past. Requests for interviews went unanswered. Mbongini Mutu, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, SABC invited uh, Mr. Nazim Howa, Chief Executive of Oak Bay Investments, to clarify the company's way forward following the recent problems facing it. Our business reporter, Francis Hurd, sat down with Mr. Hazim, who first explained the plight facing his employees. Primary in our minds right now is the job losses. You know, and that, that for us is the primary focus as a business. Uh, all businesses have shareholders and shareholders move and do this and that. But you know, for us, the sadness is that four banks have decided to close our bank accounts, making it impossible to continue a business. So our focus in the business right now is about how we preserve those jobs. In South Africa today, we've got phenomenal unemployment. Uh, last 20 years we've built the business around creating jobs if you look around our business we have a history of job creation it's not a first choice for us to shut down jobs but you know without a bank account we'll have no choice but to do so uh, but from our point of view I, I want to look the, in the eye of each ceo of each of these banks if i can get to them and we, we're going to appeal to each of those ceos to really put south africa and its people before anything else. Our workers are part of South Africa's people. What I would urge the bank CEOs and South Africans at our, uh, uh, as a whole is to really say, you know, reflect on our constitution, which says you are innocent until proven guilty. Mm. And then to say, so let, where have we been found guilty of any matter? We've, we've, we've put it on record that 1% of our business comes from state. 1%, that's the 2015 audited financials. All right. Our businesses are built on transparency, arm's length third party transactions. That's why I want to appeal to these banking CEOs, look into your hearts, think of these 7,500 families. All right. Don't make a cold decision just to put people out on the streets. Uh, don't act on perceptions. I'm very happy to meet with each of them and for them to ask me any question they want on our business. But think of the 7,500 people that they may be putting on the street. Well, labor unions also concerned with the future of the troubled Gupta families. Companies have weighed in, some calling for government and the banks to reconsider their decisions to cut ties with the companies. Here's more on this clip. We are a trade union organization, we are a workers' organization. This decision inadvertently has affected workers who right now they are not sure whether they have a future with those employers or not. We are very much concerned about that. But two, we think there is hypocrisy. You will remember that uh, in 2010, the big five, I won't name them, in the construction industry, they would have collided. They were found guilty by the Competition Commission to have colluded and fixed prices they were found guilty and fined over a billion rands. These banks, not a single one had to cut ties with them. Yet they were found guilty of a serious crime of collusions, those construction companies. So what companies. are you basically saying? Are you Selective saying that... Selective punishment. So are you saying that the bank's decisions were politically motivated? They are politically motivated. We know who sits in the APSA bank. We know who sits in the other bank, politicians, who are involved in the debate that is currently obtaining. Look, we have no brief from the Guptas. We actually do not like what they do while having a fight with them on uh, conditions of work in other areas where they operate. But if we allow in South Africa a situation where banks will decide and collude for no apparent reason that is shown to everybody to take a decision as drastic as this one. You know, Kosatu banks with one of these banks. What will we do tomorrow if they decide we don't like Kosatu, then we're cutting ties with them. What, what's going to happen to the work Kosatu does in the country? That's how 
bad this thing is. And we're calling on them really, really to review their decision. The problem that we foresee as the National Union of Mine Workers is that um, some of the workers may not be able to get their salaries uh, this month and uh, going forward. But the good thing about it is that um, the operations uh, are still in South Africa and then um, any interested business, you know, a person if uh, they have also abandoned the, the, the operations will be able to have an opportunity uh, to grab those operations because the mining license, uh, as far as we understand, belongs to the state. We see that the company is liquidated, there, is, there, there should be a processes. If the company you are selling to another stakeholder, there should be a processes in terms of Labor Relations Act. And then if it's in terms of shutting down the company, there will be another guidelines through the Labor Relations Act, whether you retrench those workers and you leave the company. So there are processes uh, that can be followed in order to address what those companies are facing currently. It's not that you wake up in the morning and close down. So I think the government should come on board and see to it that uh, its people I mean, are safeguarded in terms of their rights and their conditions of employment. I think one thing that must be raised is that at ANN7 workers were not paid on time uh, for a couple of months from now up until this date. And uh, so we, we should not be Feel, feeling that uh, there will be something major worse happening because workers have been exploited there. So we're calling to, to South Africans that to have conscious uh, to preserve this institution and provide quality and sustainable jobs. And the, the, the remaining people in, in the business fraternity, they must come in to preserve that institution. Well, the EFF, if you remember, was the first organization to distance itself from the Gupta family when it announced that it had banned all Gupta media outlets and journalists from attending its gatherings. Now, the utterances of its leader, Julius Malema, were heavily criticized following the outcry that his utterances caused. We called the party's spokesperson, Buisen Inlozi, to come and clarify them. And I'm sure you still remember that standoff that ensued between Buisen Inlozi and uh, Professor Stephen Friedman. All right, so let's have a quick look now at the tweets that have been coming through this hour. Shoni Nyetanyane says the promise of councillors' performance contracts sounds like a dysfunctional presidential hotline. Sounds familiar? Luara says there was nothing wow about it. Same old promises. Eastern Cape people are tired of false promises. Native SA says what call do they heed to the public to fight corruption? Yet same faces who are determined to fight are partaking in it. And last but not least, SA problems unique. SA problems says of course they will. Now matter, no matter how much the ANC screw them over, they will vote for them. This is why SA is toast. Well, NC's, uh, NCMP's call for introspection within the party. Here's a quick look at this clip. The very fact that we are here in Nelson Mandela, a very important um, region and province for ourselves, goes to show that we're looking for the best opportunities where we can be able to reach out to our people, especially in places where it is said we are going to have difficulties. We are here because we know that this is a very important area. We cannot afford to lose it for many historical reasons, but also for purposes of ensuring that the future remains in the hands of the African National Congress, whose main objective is to serve the people of South Africa. We need to be able to accept criticism. We need to be able to talk about the mistakes that would have happened. We need to be able to accept whatever corrections are made. We need to be able to say to our people that the ANC still remains a reliable party which they can you know, put their confidence on. The cadres of the ANC, they have to do one thing, the one that we do best, interacting with the masses of our country, explaining what is it that we have not managed to achieve that we promised in the previous manifesto. Because I know that everybody knows that we have delivered certain services, but here and there they are not happy because of the problems that arose. Now the time has arrived that we go out there and explain the challenges and therefore seek for advice that how can we turn the situation around so that together we can move South Africa forward. 
I think uh, we all need to look within, uh, look very deep within the organization, look at the challenges we are facing, particularly the issues that are coming from grassroots. What are the issues that are emanating from our people and ensure that we go out to address them. It's no longer about just listening. We have to effect change. Ordinary citizens of our country are looking to the ANC to bring about change. And uh, we hope that uh, with the launch of the manifesto, we will all get our mandate and understand the work that is before us towards the elections. All right, let's move on now and focus our attention to continental news. This week marked the second anniversary of the kidnapped girls by a Nigerian extremist group, Boko Haram. Now, there seems to be a general consensus that the world has forgotten these girls. But reports allege that the latest video of the girls was circulated last week, and it is reported that some parents were able to spot their children. Lahana Tsodetsi compiled this in search for us. Two years ago, in a high-profile attack that sparked a global outcry, Boko Haram militants raided the school in April 2014 while the girls were taking exams. They loaded 270 of them onto trucks, though around 50 escaped shortly afterwards. And two years on, 219 of the girls abducted that night remain missing, despite a global campaign, hashtag bring back our girls, involving celebrities and U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama calling for them to be found. There have been protests to remember them. Bring back our girls now and alive. Nigeria's government and military faced heavy criticism for their handling of the incident. Former President Goodluck Jonathan, who declined to comment on the kidnappings for almost three weeks, was criticized and became the first sitting Nigerian president to lose an election in 2015. His successor, President Muhammadu Buhari, ordered a new investigation into the abductions in January 2016. I feel really sad and really kind of disappointed in our government for not being able to bring back the Chiba girls um, sooner than now because I feel that if I was one of the Chiba girls, I would still be in captivity up till now. Esther Yakubu's daughter is one of the missing Chibok girls. The distressed parent, who has four other children, says she has wished for death many times. For me, if not because of God, I don't know that up to now I'm still alive. Because when this incident happened, honestly, I just feel like if I'm not on the surface of this earth, it's better for me than to be alive, to see and to witness such. Hope for the girls was briefly raised in April 2015 when the Nigerian military announced it had rescued 200 girls and 93 women from the Sambisa forest. It was later revealed that Chibok girls were not among them. I don't know why other children will be found and not our girls. Why not one? We know we will not get all of them, but we want to see even one so that she will tell us the story of what happened. To the others. So if this Boko Haram are defeated without our guests, I don't think Boko Haram is defeated. About 2,000 girls and boys have been kidnapped by Boko Haram since the beginning of 2014, according to Amnesty International, which says they are used as cooks, sex slaves, fighters, and even suicide bombers. All right, and now to wrap up the show, on a lighter note, our Miss South Africa received a hero's welcome back home. Let's take a look at how it all went down. Back home where it all started, standing tall among her peers and well-wishers, the excitement is palpable. From humble beginnings to the glitzy stage of the country, Dandoyen Gozi is a beacon of hope for these rural girls. It will encourage most women to focus on their education, improve their education in here, here in Pumalanga for young girls and then she will also be a motivation to the young girls. If she has made us so proud, that's what we can say about her. We are so proud of Tandeng Kosminen. Miss South Africa wants to make a difference in the lives of young girls. She plans to inspire as many young girls as possible by taking them to work. 
I do believe that this will motivate a lot of young people to also go out and do their best to uh, get their dreams started and make them a reality. So this means a great deal to me. I'm so happy to be home and it's just a matter of being thankful to the community that came out as well, the people that have supported me throughout my pageant life. The 23-year-old will soon graduate, adding another feather to her portfolio. The last Miss South Africa to come out of this province has gone to become Miss World, a dream Tando Yengo Sikunene hopes to achieve. Her next big stop will be Miss Universe and Miss World. Dumela Macho. What a jubilant uh, crowd there with Dubela Machoho. Well, that was a special hour of the week's uh, top newsmakers recap. Do make a date with us next week when we'll bring you another informative hour right here on the SABC News channel. I'm back on top of the hour though with M News. It's goodbye for now.